And, uh, whoa. Voice of authority. Yeah. yeah. Whoa. My name is Steve, and tonight we're going to be talking about how to respond to authority and where authority comes from, and especially how do you, how do you respond to the government, and is there a time when you can rebel? Well, what do you think? So before we, before we get started, um, Benj, can I get you to pray for us? Sure. Yeah. Benj is basically in charge of uh, all the Wednesday night meetings, and I really appreciate him asking me to, to do these first two. So. Yeah, it's great. Father God, thank you for another day. <clears throat> Lord, as I think back from last week, it's already been a week, so we're just thankful for how you preserve us and you've given us health, you've given us enough food. Shelter, Lord, all these things that we take for granted that many people in the world don't have. We're just grateful for that. Thank you for this church, for the faithful teachers that we have. Lord, I pray you would be with Steve now, that you would give him clarity of thought, help us to learn and be challenged and encouraged by what we hear. Boy, I feel like I'm a long ways away, but all my notes are here, and this is where I. Uh, control this thing. So let me start with a, a story. I, uh, a number of years ago, I, um, I was living in Roseburg, Oregon. If you know anything about Roseburg, it's a very small town. There's, there's, there is a downtown, and there's a single street called Jackson Street. That's kind of the main street. And um, I was running some errands, and it was on my birthday, and, it, and I, did, I wasn't working. So I thought I'd stop downtown in, uh, in, in the office of the church, which was separate from the church, but we had a downtown office. And so I thought I'd just go in there, say hi, spend 20 minutes, and just encourage people. So I did. Uh, parked there, went in. 20 minutes later, I came out, <clears throat> and I had a ticket. I had a ticket slipped under my windshield wiper and I'd been cited for parking in the downtown commercial zone as an employee of a business located downtown. And it, and it cost me $39. So, you know, did I say it was my day off and that it was my birthday? And that I thought, this is crazy because what this means is that if, if, I, if I can't ever go downtown driving the car that I usually drive in to work for uh, and, and shop, that means I can never shop and park downtown. I thought, well, that's just nuts. So <clears throat> um, did I mention it was my day off as well? <laughs> so I took the ticket. I marched down to City Hall. I found the appropriate person to talk to, and I pled my case. And, uh, you know, I, I, I remember what I said. I said, you, uh, I wasn't there on business. It, it, it's my day off. Uh, I, I, I wasn't working. Yes, ma'am, I, I understand that if em, that employees park downtown, there won't be any open places for shoppers to park. But are you saying that as, a, as an employee of a downtown business, I can never park anywhere downtown, even if I'm shopping downtown? because I have a business downtown? Is that what you're saying? Um, I mean, the words that were going through my mind to, dis, you know, to describe the absolute idiocy of that rule, I can't really articulate in front of you. <laughs> so I paid the $39 and I stomped out in a Christ-like sort of way. <clears throat> so, you know, there are times in our lives when we, we would wish that there's no authority. I mean, wouldn't that just be great? Nobody's telling you what to do. Nobody's giving you speeding tickets or forcing you to pay taxes or issuing stupid rules about where you can and can't park or making you pay overdraft fees or, uh, or not allowing you to participate in sports unless you get certain grades. I mean, wouldn't life really be great without people cramping your style and, and imposing their restrictions on your freedom and sticking their nose into your business? I mean, wouldn't that be great? No authority. Or would it? Well, I mean, try to imagine just for a minute as a thought experiment, a world without authority. I mean, you could take red lights and stop signs as suggestions. Oh, wait, this is Boise. I, we, 
we already do that. <laughs> um, you could still have rules, but, you know, in a world without authority, nobody would enforce them. And so if a running back stepped out of bounds on his way to the end zone, there'd be no official to bring the ball back uh, and, and start again where, where he stepped out. Rules would be um, totally voluntary, which, which really means that they would be mostly meaningless. If someone came into your store and, uh, and they saw something that they liked, they might take it without paying for it. And, and if they were bigger and stronger than you or armed better, uh, or if no, no authority would catch them and prosecute them for what they did, you couldn't do much about it because it's a world without authority. Now, that's, that's Portland and Seattle and San Francisco right now. People could make promises and not keep them with, without any consequences. Businesses could enter into contracts and break them without any penalties. In short, there would be no law and there would be no order. And my guess is, in that world, individuals would soon attempt to impose some law and some enforcement and some protection in the world. And once again, we would have some authority. Because authority is built into the fabric of existence. If you have people together uh, you, and you live close to each other, you're going to have to live with some common rules and, and, and some laws, and that means you're going to have to deal with authority. Authority is part of life. But if you mention the word authority, I think you'll find yourself faced with a whole range of responses from people. I mean, some people love it, they advocate it, they practice it at home, at work, in the church. Other people despise it, they downplay it, they temper it. They, some, some people just rebel against all forms of authority. But like it or not, all of us have to deal with authority. Parents and children, governments, and citizens, husband and wife, employee, employer, teacher, student, IRS, breadwinner, breadwinners, leaders, congregation, foreign governments, missionaries, they all deal with authority. And each of us may have some different views regarding how authority is supposed to work in these relationships. But one thing is really certain, that you can't escape dealing with authority because it's everywhere. You, the question isn't, must, must I live with it? Uh, the question is, how do I live with it? Because every single time you turn around in any relationship, there's an element of authority. So at the, at the outset, I want to say that this is a very complicated topic, and I'm not going to... Um, I mean, I started with an idea of what I was going to do, and it was, like, it was like three hours, you know? And so I thought, okay, I'm not doing that. And I have the authority to make that decision. So, um, but I, I, I want, what, I, what I intend to do is introduce you to some of the questions and problems to help you form some convictions and, um, and at the end, I'm gonna, I'll try to answer any questions, but I just want you to start thinking about authority and, uh, and especially when it comes to the government, because this year uh, we have lots of opportunity to deal with um, authority and the question of, of, do you have to obey all authority? So um, how many of you were here last week? Oh, cool, okay. Um, and, you, and you all understood the target backwards and forwards, right? Did anybody have any questions about the target? Not one. Yeah, did you have one? David? Um, what was supposed to be, whether it was like the questions were pertaining personally to our own decision or, or to a broader uh, spectrum as far as like a group. Yeah. yeah. Um, well, I, th I think the target works um, for individuals and for groups. I know that, that as elders, we use the target all the time trying to figure out you know, wh where whatever this thing is that we're dealing with, where it fits. So anytime that I, I'm talking with somebody and, and we begin to polarize and the, the person across the table as we slurp coffee together, there's an, uh, I, I realize the temperature is going up and we're starting to, the, you know, the voices are going up. Usually what I do is I, I try to calm the other, calm down. And, 
I'll grab a napkin and I'll draw the tar- a target. And then I'll explain it to the person. There's some things you die for, some things you divide over, some things are worth debating about, but you know, don't leave. Some things that you just discuss, it's your personal conviction, and some things just don't matter, right? And so what I try to do is say, let's put it, just decide what we're gonna do with this thing that we're talking about. Where does it go on the target? We'll have that discussion, and usually what ends up happening is that the temperature goes down. And, and so, yeah, and so um, then we can talk about it because I know if it, unless, it's, unless it's to die for or divide over, uh, you know, I, I, typically I'm not going to, I'll talk about it. I'll, I'll engage. Um, if, it's to, if it's to divide over or die over for, in that other person's mind, I don't think that the, the discussion is worth having because you know that unless you are exactly the same as the other person, they're gone, right? So I just want to talk about something else, you know? And, I, and I'll say, you know, I'm, I don't want the relationship to suffer, and I think it will if we continue to talk. So because you're putting it here and I'm putting it outside there. But the moment that you say that it, it's a debatable thing, but don't leave, you know, let's not rupture the relationship. It's okay for us to get hot over this, but we're not going to, to walk away from each other. All of a sudden now you have the freedom to listen and talk and disagree and all kinds of things. So it does work really well one-on-one. Does that make sense? Yes, it does. Yeah. Thank you. So, yeah, sure. So... Um, so the reason why I have this here is because I wanted to go over, this is what the, this is what the target is, and um, as you increase in importance, you go to the center. As you um, go away from the center, you're decreasing in certainty. In other words, something might be pretty important, but nobody agrees on it, and so you, can't, you really can't be dying over that thing, you know? On the other hand, um, if... if uh, you know, if, if people are certain about it and, uh, and, and it's important, for instance, the resurrection of Christ, okay, that, that's one that, you know, you know, you can put a gun to my head and threaten to yank the trigger. I'm, I'm, not, I'm not going against that. So certainty and importance pushes whatever the issue is toward the center and decreasing certainty and decreasing importance what color of chairs do we have? How many parking places do we have? Well, that goes kind of out. Does that make sense? Okay. So on this one, on the issue of authority, I can tell you that it should be, I think, a hot debate. A hot debate because not everybody agrees with what I'm going to say. Um, in fact, there's, a, there's like nine positions. And I mine's right, but, you know, it's... Um, <laughs> But there are like, there's a, a lot of disagreement about this. And, but, and it is important uh, because how you d- decide you're going to respond to authority, especially when it comes to the government, then, uh, you know, you've got, it's going gonna, it's gonna to affect your life. And uh, it'll probably affect your relationships too. I mean, when we talk about masks and social distancing and um, injections, uh, you know, there's a lot of stuff there and a lot of people got, you know, they, they polarized over it and, um, and, and they were trying to figure out where, what do we do? How do we handle this? So I thought that uh, faith community did a good job with that. So um, if you disagree with me when we're done, don't leave, okay? You don't, don't walk away from that, uh, for, from our relationship. Okay, so... Um, Here's, hopefully you all got a handout. It's two pages, but it, part of the reason it's two pages is, is that I didn't know if you all uh, brought your Bible. So I, I'm, um, I have uh, written uh, or printed the, the passage that we're going to focus on, Romans 13. And um, so it's the, it's the left side, right side, and on the, on the back side is a chart we're going to go over later on. So let's... Let's just talk about the question of authority. Uh, Okay, in his letter to the Romans, Paul writes in chapter 12 and urges us to surrender to God as the ultimate authority in our lives. 
and to serve others and to share our lives in love. And so then he turns from that, from that personal um, uh, commitment to God and to the church to, um, to uh, help us understand how to see and respond to authority in our lives. And I think that topic would have been of great interest to first century Christians because uh, of the Jew- it was the Jewish authorities which engineered Christ's crucifixion. And it was the Roman authorities uh, who are now making it increasingly difficult uh, for the followers of Christ. And it would be all the more true for Paul's readers because they were living in Rome, which, was, which would be kind of like living in Washington, D.C. That's the seat of power for the ancient world. And it would bring up all kinds of issues about authority and how to, how to interact with the authorities. And so this is what Paul is writing. So go ahead and... Follow along as I read that, this whole passage. And we'll come back and we'll tear it apart. Paul writes, Let every person be subject to the governing, the governing authorities, for there's no authority except from God, and those that exist have been instituted by God. Therefore, whoever resists the authorities resists what God has appointed, and those who resist will incur judgment. For rulers are not a terror to good conduct, but to bad. Would you have no fear of the one who is in authority? Then do what is good, and you'll receive his approval, for he is God's servant for your good. But if you do wrong, be afraid, for he does not bear the sword in vain. For he is the servant of God, an avenger who carries out God's wrath on the wrongdoer. Therefore, one must be in subjection, not only to avoid God's wrath, but also for the sake of conscience. For because of this, you also pay taxes for the authorities or ministers of God attending to this very thing. Pay to all what is owed to them, taxes to whom taxes are owed, revenue to whom revenue is owed, respect to whom respect is owed, and honor to whom honor is owed. Okay, so uh, it seems pretty daunting, but when we tear it apart, you'll, you'll get, I think, a really good idea of what Paul is talking about. All right, so what is authority? Well, authority is the right and the power to command and enforce behavior. It's the right and the power to command and enforce behavior. So um, authority is the ability to command behavior. You can't jaywalk. Uh, You must not take what is yours. You must pay your bills on time. You cannot deliberately injure a person just because you're angry. You have to be home by midnight. Uh, you have to have this job done by, by end of business day. All those are commands. And whether it's from a policeman enforcing the law or a parent guiding behavior or a, a boss setting a deadline, authority is involved. And, and that authority really has to be legitimate. legitimate. Uh, it has, it's, you, there's a right to authority. And so the person um, must have the right to command. A guy on the sidewalk has no right to tell my kids what to do. I have no right to pull over uh, over and jail someone who cuts me off in traffic, although I have fantasized about it. And then the person has to have the power to enforce whatever he says. He or the institution he represents has to rightly be able to enforce the behavior or the prohibition with in consequences that get imposed, like tickets or fees or loss of privileges or incarceration or an F on a paper or loss of life. Uh, all of that can be legitimate enforcement. So what is authority? It's the right and the power to command and enforce behavior. Make sense? Okay. So who possesses it? Well, governing authorities and rulers. If you look at verse 1, it says, let every person be subject to the governing authorities. And that's a, that, that's a very interesting word. It emphasizes their power. They're placed over us with powers to command and enforce. And the term is really general. It includes any proper authority, including law enforcement officers and parents and even elders of a church. Anyone who has legitimate authority is part of the governing authorities. It's not just talking about uh, the Roman Senate, for instance. Uh, And then look at verse 3. 
He uses a different word, for rulers are not a terror to good conduct, rulers. Um, apparently, rulers have authority, but that word emphasizes their position. And the term narrows the scope really to, to civil officials, mostly those in social and political and economic authority. So civil rulers of the time were not, uh, most of them were not Christians, and many were not even fond of those who were Christians. So today, Paul would probably be pointing to civil government, its laws and its law enforcement officials, those in official positions uh, of authority in society. That's what the rulers are talking, uh, that's, they have, the rulers have authority. Uh, okay, so, governing authorities and rulers. And where do they get their authority? Well, this is where it just gets really crazy. They get it from God. Look at the second part of verse 1. For there is no authority except from God. And those that exist have been instituted by God. Uh, verse 2 uh, whoever res resists the authorities resist what God has appointed. And then drop down to verse 4. He is God's servant. So if you go back to verse 1, Paul says it first negatively. There is no authority except from God. And then he repeats it positively. And those that exist have been instituted by God. Because I think that, the, uh, that all authority, that this notion that all authority really comes from God, that God was the one that thought it up, God created it, God uh, imbued certain people with positions of authority. Uh, he delegated authority to people. Uh, and, and I think that, that um, in that day, people, that, that, that notion would be really startling. And... They were authorities, Paul says, not simply because they had the biggest stick or because they had the uh, commander of the army's allegiance, but because all authority issues from God himself who sets up and deposes others. And I, I know if you start thinking of this, you think, oh my gosh, really? Do you really believe that? Can that is that possible? And the answer is yes, it is possible, and yes, I do believe that. In the Old Testament, one of the first superpowers of the day was uh, in the Babylonian kingdom. It's now uh, basically Iraq. And it was led by a guy by the name of uh, Nebuchadnezzar, a real mouthful. And uh, Babylon overran Judea, scooped up its inhabitants, and deposited those people in uh, Jewish ghettos in Babylon, leaving the land of Israel unoccupied for 70 years. And during that time, Daniel rose to prominence in the Babylonian kingdom as an advisor, and he often spoke for God to the king. And he interpreted dreams, he announced warnings of judgment, and just take a, a look, just glance at some of the things that he said. Daniel chapter 2, Blessed be the name of God forever and ever to whom belong wisdom and might. Who? He, that's God, removes kings and sets up kings. Hmm. And then he speaks directly to the king. You, O king, Nebuchadnezzar, the king of kings, to whom the God of heaven has given the power, the might, and the glory. Just think about that. It's, it's this Jewish God that allows Nebuchadnezzar to have authority. In Daniel 4, it says that the living may know that the Most High, speaking of God, rules the kingdom of men and gives it to whom he will and sets over it the lowliest of men. And then later on in the chapter, you, Nebuchadnezzar, shall be made to eat grass like an ox. You shall be wet with the dew of heaven and seven periods of time shall pass over you till you know that the Most High rules the kingdom of men and gives it to whom he will. So where does authority to rule come from? Where does it come from in Boise or the United States or Iraq or China or the Sudan or Belgium? And the answer is, in all those places, it comes from God. That kind of blows your mind, doesn't it? 
Since all authority is from God, individuals and institutions who exercise legitimate authority have a right to command our behavior and the power to enforce compliance and punish disobedience. And there are primarily three divine institutions that God gives authority to. Um, one is the family. The family has authority. Uh, two is the government. The government has authority. All of us know that. Um, and three, the church has authority. Now, you think, okay, these are spheres of authority that God has established. There's no problem with that until, until they overlap. And believe me, they do overlap. They overlap very much. You'll notice that there are some areas where the government and the family share uh, authority, where the church and the government shares authority, church and family th shares authority. And there's some places and some uh, things where the family, the government, and the church share authority. Let me just give one. Abortion. Okay, abortion. Well, that's, I think the family has something to say about that. I think the church has something to say about that. And uh, our society, our government has something to say about it. And they, and they conflict. They conflict. There, is, there, is, um, there are conflicting authorities in, in just that one issue. So I just want you to see that, that sometimes where there are clear roles and responsibilities, the authority isn't a, isn't a problem, uh, or it's at least a different kind of a problem. But where the responsibilities and roles overlap, uh, it, that can become a, a big problem. They don't, because people don't always play nice with each other. All three have authority, proper authority, from God. Okay, so they get it from God. So here's the implication. Proper authority are servants of God and answerable to God. Look at verse 4. Verse 4, he, the one in authority, is God's servant for your good. We'll, um, we'll come back to that in just a minute. And then look at um, the second part. He does not bear the sword in vain, for he is a servant of God. And then verse 6 because of this, you pay taxes for the authorities are ministers of God. So they're God's servant, a servant of God, and ministers of God. They serve at God's bidding and, are, and, and they must give an account to, to God. So let me, let me clarify myself uh, what I think it, this is saying and what it isn't saying. This, never, this is not establishing um, the type of a government, for instance, a dictatorship or a kingship or a democracy or a republic. It's not saying anything like that. It's, it's basically allowing for the principle of, go of government. And it doesn't mean that everything that a government does is wise or fair or even right. It simply means that God wants governments to exist and grants them authority to rule for a time, and he places individuals in those governments that he has raised up for his purposes. And all, every government and every person in government answers to God for this stewardship. There's plenty of illustrations in the Bible of God judging both leaders and governments for their pride, their godly, uh, godlessness, their moral fa failures. And God claims the right to topple governments, and he does. There's a wide divergence of governments in the Bible. Um, when I finally figured that out, I thought, well, this is really interesting to me. Um, there are kings with ultimate authority. There are kings with limited authority. Uh, for instance, the Assyrian government was different than the Babylonian government, and the Medo-Persian government was different than either one. Greeks had uh, democratic city-states. Rome had a republic with a Caesar and a Senate. And even in Israel, the government morphed over time from a very limited government of judges to a, to a centralized government of kings, and then later to a Sanhedrin of 70 being under the thumb of foreign governments. They, the governments didn't look the same. So the idea that the Bible teaches, for instance, that kings have ultimate authority um, and that's the right kind of government in, in the Bible is just not accurate. I've heard people say that, and I thought, huh, is that really true? 
Well, there are very different governments represented in the, in the scriptures. There's a guy by the name of uh, Samuel Rutherford. Anybody ever hear that guy? He's a, he was a pastor. He was a Presbyterian pastor. And he, was, he wrote a paper, um, and it, I think it was called Rex Lex. Rex Lex. Lex. And um, Rex is, means the king, and Lex means the law. And he argued... Um, that, uh, that there are two basically forms of government. One is that the, that the king is the law. And whatever the king says is what we have to do. And uh, the other, uh, that's Rex Lex. And, and he said, no, no, no. It should be Lex Rex. That the law is king and the king is subject to the law and everybody is equal under the law and should be judged equally and dispassionately by the law. So what's interesting is that as a result of, of, uh, of Rutherford's influence, uh, we are now living under a democratic and constitutional republic with limited powers, and everybody is accountable to and judged impartially by the same laws, more or less. Um, but that's really where it came from. And our founders read that and was really influenced by uh, Samuel Ruther Rutherford's idea. And it was, it was an idea that took the world by storm. Uh, it goes all the way back, by the way, to uh, Persia. You can see it where in Medo-Persia, uh, once the king made a, um, a statement, made a law, he was under the law. And so it wasn't quite the same, but you get this idea that uh, like Nebuchadnezzar could have done anything. He could, he could make laws, he could rescind laws, he could do anything he wanted. But, um, but in Medo-Persia, if they made a law, they would have to live by it. And you see that in the book of Esther. Okay, so, so why do they exist? Um, Paul talks about why governments exist. And um, the first is to promote good. If you look at verses 3 and 4, for rulers are not a terror to good conduct, but to bad. Would you have no fear of the one who's in authority? Then do what is good, and you will receive his approval. For he is God's servant for your good. It says it about three or four times. And it's assumed that the charter of a government is to do good to those under its authority. And, and um, I think it's more than merely just do things that seem to be good for them pragmatically. In other words, like pave the streets and develop a landfill and police the rowdies, that kind of thing. That certainly is part of it. But I think it's really interesting that the, that the word there, the phrase there is the good, the good, as if there are standards of good external to the government that God has decreed, and part of government's pur purpose is to promote those standards. So you have to say, who gets to define what is good? Who gets to define what is good? Can we just say anything is good? Is whatever, ever, uh, whatever law that we make, is that, is that part of the good? Well, I would submit that's not the case that there are moral laws that judge our, uh, our government. And I want you to notice the implication that government exists, always exists, to serve people. People don't exist to serve the government. And uh, that's why Lincoln, in his Gettysburg's, uh, Gettysburg Address, spoke of our government as, anybody know this phrase, of the people by the people, and for the people. Nobody learns any of this stuff anymore. But part of protecting and encouraging good is discouraging the opposite. So the other ex uh, reason why government exists is to punish wrongdoing. And so the second part of verse 4 that we just read, he, he does not bear the sword in vain. If you do wrong, be afraid, for he does not bear the sword in vain. Well, the sword is a weapon. You don't spank people with the sword. What do you do with the sword? What? Yeah, you kill a person. Yeah, it's, it's capital punishment. Um, you skewer him or you decapitate him. And the sword represents not only the power to enforce, like for instance, it would be today, it would be a gun, but also the authority to punish, the execution. 
Um, and it, that when, it, when he says to that extreme, he's also saying everything before, like fines and uh, jail or prison, that kind of thing. So the idea is to punish what's wrong and to promote what's good. And then third, uh, he doesn't, he, Paul doesn't mention this here, but it used, he mentions it in 1 Timothy 2. It's to promote civil peace. And it's really interesting um, when, I, uh, when, uh, when I read this, Paul is writing to Timothy, his understudy, and he says this, first of all, then I urge that supplications, prayers, intercessions, and thanksgivings be made for all people, for kings... And all who are in high positions of authority, that we may lead a peaceful and quiet life, godly and dignified in every way. This is good. This is part of the good. And is pleasing in the sight of God our Savior who desires all people to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. Paul understands that if, if people in authority do the good, if they do their jobs, if they, if they push back and punish uh, um, wrong, then the result will be a peaceful and stable environment in which people will be able to live and speak freely, and all of which would be very conducive to the spread of the good news. So think about that. A government is supposed to do good, is promote good, reward good, good external to, to them. They're to punish evil. And, there, and as a result, they're, they're to promote uh, peace. And Paul says that it has the benefit of us being able to proclaim the gospel without looking over our shoulder. Dr. F.F. Uh, F. Bruce summarizes this, and he says this, Human government is a divine ordinance, and the powers of coercion and commendation which it exercises have been entrusted to it by God for the repression of crime and the encouragement of righteousness. Yeah, and that's what I say too. Okay. Uh, how do you, how do you, how should we, anybody, any questions so far? Is this nailing it? How should we respond to it? Well, be subject. Verse 1, let every person be subject. And then verse 5, therefore, one must be in subjection. That's the same word that other versions translate, submit. And it's not an option. It is emphatic. In other words, Paul would say no Christian should think himself exempt from the responsibility to submit to proper authority. Now, I could see how some in Paul's day might reason that they really wouldn't have to because, you know, Rome was increasingly restrictive toward Christians. And many authorities were just pagans and they, and they treated Christians unfairly, unjustly. Uh, many of officials even turned a blind eye toward believers' rights. And I'm sure that some Christians thought, well, you know, Paul can't mean for me to submit to to that guy, to this situation, I'm there, there, again and again, they're, they're going after Christians for go, no good reason. Paul meant, yes, submit to those people. It helps to understand what submission refers to. It doesn't mean obedience. Uh, there are three other words in the Greek language that clearly mean obey, and this isn't one of them. This is a broader idea that describes the proper attitude in a number of relationships in the New Testament, like slaves to masters and children to parents and wives to husbands, of Christians to leaders of the church and, of course, citizens to government. All of those use this same word. And uh, to submit actually means um, to place yourself under proper authority in a relationship. It involves three things. It involves recognize the authority. You recognize it as legitimate. You, you realize that this person is, a, uh, is using God-ordained authority. You recognize it. And two, you respect it. You show respect to the position, even if the person occupying the position doesn't personally command your respect. And three, you respond to the authority. You make an honest attempt to fulfill the duties which the authorities impose on you in that relationship. 
It doesn't mean obey. It means submit. Um, you can actually obey and not submit. Uh, there's a story about a little kid who was standing up on the seat of his car, and his mom uh, said, you've got to sit down, and he doesn't. And so his mom repeats the command a little more sternly. He, sa- he says, you need to sit down right now, and he remains standing. Finally, his mom turns around and threats- threatens him and says, sit down right now. So he caves in, and he mutters, okay, okay, I'm sitting down on the outside, but on the inside, I'm standing up. That's obedience, that's not submission. Okay, it was me. It was, I, it was that. Uh, yeah, yeah. So why should I submit? Well, Paul knows what's going on and what he's asking. Because Paul, remember, had been jailed wrongly. He had the judicial process rigged against him. He'd been uh, a target of you know, the official's religious bias and wrong pronouncements, and yet he was the one that is saying this, you be subject to them, you submit. So, okay, what's the next question? Well, it's got to be, why should we respond this way? And and I'm going to give you three good reasons for it. Number one, uh, because of our convictions. This is, these are the convictions. There's no authority except from God, and those that exist have been instituted by God. That's, you know, that's a, that's a great conviction. Verse 4, for he is God's servant for your good. So the authority that they have has been given by God, and God gave them that authority. He can take it away. As Christians, you and I believe in authority. We ought to submit to it. Uh, by definition, all true authority is proper. Otherwise, it's not authority. It's just bullying, or it's the threat of violence. And authority comes from God. God has an interest in promoting law and order and authority and submission. So we need to do, we need to submit because of these convictions that God has a hand in the people that are over us. And then secondly, because of consequences. Well, I mean, the consequences are in uh, verse, verse 2 about incurring judgment and um, if you do wrong, be afraid. Verse 4, he does not bear the sword in vain. I mean, who wants to get hurt? When you see a policeman and you're going 35 and it's a 25 mile an hour zone, what do you do? So you speed up, right? No. You hit the brakes. You tap the brakes, right? Am I the only one that does that? Of course. Uh, it's what we do. We don't want the consequences. And, uh, you know, you don't want to get arrested. Uh, if, you know, you don't want to fight in school and get expelled. You don't want to suffer any consequences for wrong or for criminal behavior. Um, so, it, you know, if it's difficult to believe that God has delegated authority to government, just, you know, you submit to their authority simply to avoid the consequences. You don't want the consequences. Avoid the consequences. If you work downtown in Roseburg, don't park downtown. You'll get a ticket. And it's crazy. Okay. Uh, And the third reason is, is, is kind of interesting to me is because of a conscience. That's what he says in verse five. One must be in subjection not only to avoid God's wrath, but also for the sake of conscience. And this sounds kind of redundant because you'd think, okay, maybe he's just repeating the idea that if God's behind authority and we know it, we shouldn't go against our consciences. If that's really what he was meaning, um, I think he probably would have said, don't go against your convictions, not don't go against your conscience. And here's the point. Um, when you and I know what's right and wrong what the rules and the laws are, and we deliberately break them, we whittle down the sharp edges of our conscience. And so the more that we do that, the easier it is to do it again and again, and the less it bothers us. My, uh, my fourth grade teacher explained it to me this way. She said that conscience is sort of like a triangle in, in, your, in your soul, in your heart, in your mind. And when you do something wrong, that triangle spins and it hurts because it, that the sharp edges, uh, you know, kind of make you, it, just, it hurts. Well, if you keep doing it over a long period of time, those sharp edges wear off. So now when you do things, your conscience spins and you feel nothing. 
You know that's true, that the first time that you do something wrong is really traumatic, especially if you know that it's wrong. Have you ever, have you ever known where the line is and you know you shouldn't step over it and you do? Who has, who has done that in their life? Okay, yeah. That's called a trespass, a trespass. The first time you do that, it's really hard. The second time, it's a little easier. The 40th time, I don't even think about it. The reverse is true, too. For people who have been accustomed to doing wrong, the first time you say no is very hard. The 40th time, you know, it's a little easier. Okay, so because of conscience, we should respond to authority. Um, then what specifically must I do? What is he telling us to do if, we, if we're, um, he's giving examples, he's not doing a law thing here. He's saying, if you're, if you're going to submit, these are the kinds of things that you should do. And uh, one of them is to pay. Well, what am I going to pay? Well, you're going to pay taxes and fees, verses 6 and 7. Uh, because of this, you also, because of what? Well, because there's, there are the authorities. Because of this, you also pay taxes for the authorities or ministers of God attending this very thing. The price tag for law and order in good government is ours generally to bear. It doesn't say how much. Um, it just says, do it. When, when Jesus uh, was confronted with uh, taxes, who, you know, is he going to pay taxes? He said, give me a coin. He says, uh, who's, on, who's on this? He's, and um, who's on the coin? It was the image of Caesar. And he says that, that amazing statement, render to Caesar what is Caesar's and to God what is God's. Typically, what we do is we read that and we think, yeah, Caesar's out to lunch and Caesar doesn't have any right, and, but, but God really does. No, that, no, he's not saying that at all. He's saying you should pay your taxes. He said you owe money. It's legitimate. You should pay taxes. Um, but you should also give to God what is God's. So you pay taxes and fees, but you also pay honor and respect. Um, pay to all what is owed them taxes, to taxes uh, to whom taxes are owed, revenue to whom revenue is owed, respect to whom respect is owed, honor to whom honor is, is owed. So in our words and our attitudes, both in person and behind uh, their backs, we ought to speak well of and act appropriately toward authority. If we don't, it probably says more about us than it does about them or their performance in the positions of power. Second uh, thing we should do is pray. It goes back to what uh, that passage from 1 Timothy 2, first of all, then I urge that supplications, prayers, intercessions, and thanksgivings be made for all people, for kings and all who are in high positions of, of authority. So it's clear that we're, we're to do that um, with, with other, for, other, for everybody in authority, um, not just political authority, but you should be praying for your elders. You should, you know, kids should pray for their parents. Um, uh, anytime anybody's in a position of authority, we should, pay, we should be praying for them. We're sinful people. We don't always react well to authority. And, um, and we should pray that, um, that, that they're faithful and that they keep um, serving, uh, serving God. Some people are in a positions of authority. They don't know they're serving God, but they are. And then th this is where it gets uh, different. Um, I think you should participate. The New Testament reminds us that Christians are citizens of Christ's kingdom. And that's where our primary allegiance should always rest. However... Paul, for example, claimed and used his Roman citizenship. You can look at, I think it's Acts 16 and Acts 22. And he claimed rights, his rights as a citizen of Rome. Uh, and it saved him more than just once. And he didn't shy away from claiming those rights to his advantage as a believer uh, in order to proclaim the gospel. So let me just talk about where we are right now. And this is where it's, it's going to get 
you know, I'm going to probably step on some landmines here. Um, our Bill of Rights recognizes important rights. Uh, the right to assemble, uh, to speak our mind without fear of retaliation. We call, it, we call that freedom of speech. Um, to defend people and property. These, uh, in fact, the founders of our nation stated that those rights were inalienable. In other words, they were unchangeable because they didn't come from our government. They came from God, that God was the one that did this. And so, so citizens of this country are supposed, to, are supposed to, we have responsibilities in this country, we're supposed to protect and defend the Constitution based on human rights. And so let me just make this really clear because it's kind of a fine point, but it really it makes a big difference. The, where is authority in our government? Anybody want to hazard a guess? Yeah. Where, who, where does authority come from in our government? Oh, we're going to say God. Okay. How does it, how does it come? Is it, is it the president? Yeah. It's, it's not the president. It's not Congress, it's not the Senate, uh, it's, not, it's not the House of Representatives, it's not the judicial system. Where does it come from? Well, it comes from, in our democratic republic, from the Constitution. Isn't that interesting? So here's the thing. One of the, this, 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 they still do this. Uh, every official that steps into positions of authority puts his hand on the Bible, or raises his hand, and swears what? To uphold, to protect and defend what? The Constitution of the United States. Which, why? Why? Is it just saying, pinky promise? I'm, you know, we're going we're gonna, to we're gonna do our best to do good, you know? No. No, they're, because, they, because that is a document on which our government, under, uh, un, under God, has, uh, has decided that this is what is the good. This is what is the good. And, it's, uh, and so, uh, so that's an important point because I'm going to make some points about rebellion. <clears throat> Tell me when to stop, Benj, if I get too close on the... If, 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 I'm, if I'm blowing things off, you can say, <coughs> just, uh, okay, yeah, okay. Okay, so, uh, you know, other individuals who were faced with the responsibility and opportunity to participate in their governments, which were different uh, in, uh, in the scriptures, Moses in Israel. I mean, that, that's, they, he, 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 uh, he had Lex Rex right from the very beginning. This is all about the law. In fact, which is really interesting in, in, uh, in the Bible, uh, the king was not the ultimate authority. In fact, the king was supposed to be given a, a copy uh, of the Torah as his own for him to read and remind himself of who God was and his responsibilities uh, under God. It was, it was not Rex Lex, it was Lex Rex right from the very beginning. Um, Saul and David in the early kingdom of Israel had a different, uh, different position uh, than, than Moses. Uh, Daniel in Babylon ha, uh, served in, 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 a, uh, in a very different government. Esther in Medo-Persia, uh, remember um, what was said to Esther, who knows whether, you, whether God has placed you in this, in this point of time for this very purpose. And, um, and she would have to engage according to the law and even break the law if necessary um, to, to speak for uh, her Jewish kin. In our representative democratic republic, which God has allowed and put us in under, uh, we have the responsibility as citizens to do a number of things, to be reasonably informed on issues, to obey its laws, and when we disagree with the laws, to continue to obey them as we uh, work to amend or repeal them. We should vote our conscience. Uh, we should not vote just our self-interest. We should always respect authority and those who hold it. If God leads, we should run for office. We should serve the public interest. 
uh, because I think being a Christian and being a citizen, we're, they're very two different roles, but they overlap. We shouldn't confuse them, but neither should we think that a Christian has no business participating in government. Uh, no, no human government, no matter where you find it, is, uh, is, a, is, 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 a good, is a perfectly good one in the sense that it's perfect and does everything that God wants. There's no human government um, that will fulfill uh, everything that God wants. But every human government serves as God's pleasure at God's pleasure for a certain time, and it derives authority from him. So there, there you have it. Recognize, respect, and respond, and pay, pray, and participate. You say, well, that's pretty simple. Well, okay, not so fast. What do you do when the authority is wrong? <laughs> yeah. That was perfect. You should, that's... Bill and I had kind of worked that out. So. What, do you, what do you do if you disagree with what the authorities are telling you to do or not do? Is there a time when disobedience to authority is called for? And I would say, I would submit, yes, there is. And this is the, the problem of conflicting authorities. Now, there's an incident, a real famous incident in the book of Acts. It's an incident of godly rebellion, Acts chapter 4. Um, and... Uh, Basically, what ended up happening, this whole incident is built around a collision of man's authority and God's authority. So Jesus tells uh, his disciples in Acts chapter 1, verse 8, uh, you shall be my witnesses. Talk about me. And, and pretty much it's everywhere. Uh, Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, even to the ends of the earth. And the Jewish authorities said, you shall not teach or talk about him. And so you see this collision happening, and, and uh, Peter really is, is summarizing uh, um, the, the issue. He says in Acts 4, but in order, it, what, he's not saying it, the, uh, the ruling elders are, but in order that it may spread no further among the people, let us warn them to speak no more to anyone in this name, in the name of Jesus. So they call them and charge them not to speak or teach at all in the name of Jesus. But Peter and John answered them, and it's respectful, well, whether it is right in the sight of God to listen to you rather than to God, you must judge. That's a very respectful way to answer. For we cannot but speak of what we have seen and heard. And so they were threatened. They went out. And then they, they got caught again because they, they were filling Jerusalem with the, with the story of, of the resurrection so they got arrested again. They got brack, bought, brack, they brought back in, and this is this is in Acts chapter five. And when they had brought them, they set them before the council, and the high priest questioned them, uh, saying, "We strictly charged you not to teach in this name. Yet here you have filled Jerusalem with your teaching, and you intend to bring this man's blood upon us." But Peter and the apostles answered, "We must obey God rather than men." So did they obey the authorities? Well, yes and no. No, they didn't obey human authority. Yes, they did obey God's authority. Did it cost them? Absolutely. Uh, in the first case, they were threatened, but in the second case, they were beaten bloody. So here's the principle. It's a, it's a, I think it's clear. Disobedience is divine when obedience to God conflicts with obedience to anybody else. Disobedience is divine when obedience to God conflicts with obedience to anyone else. So Christians are to obey authority unless it clearly clashes with God's. No, so no matter the sphere of existence, whether it's teacher, student, wife, husband, you know, government, citizen, child, parents, obedience to God and obedience to human authorities are both to be obeyed but disobedience will be divine when obedience to God conflicts with obedience to anybody else. Uh, it's not enough for, for the authority to do something you don't like. Uh, but, but they're not making you do it. Uh, disobedience will be divine only when the authority is commanding you to do what God forbids or forbidding you to do what God commands. So you, you have this chart. If you wanted to look up here, it's, you, you've got it. You can... You, um, I wanted to give it to you and you don't have to write anything on it. But basically think in terms of laws, commands, rules, prohibitions, instructions, restrictions, that whole thing. That's authority. 
and uh, think about the submission to authority uh, as recognize and respect and respond. And there, there's part of, uh, of this is what God commands, uh, all the stuff that God commands, and then there's all the stuff that God forbids. And then there's a whole bunch of stuff in between, and uh, the stuff in between is the exercise of authority in the human realm. So what do you do? Well, you, you have obedience to God in what he forbids and what he commands. And you have obedience to authorities, uh, authorities in the exercise in the, in, in the, in the human realm. So, um, so everything... Um, pretty much you that isn't forbidden by God or commanded by God, you know, you submit to. Well, well what happens if, if, uh, if the authority is telling you to do something that God forbids? Well, you disobey. Uh, what if they forbid you to do what God commands? Well, you disobey. You do so respectfully, but you disobey. You know, I can tell you that for, um, for years I'd taken the more passive position, uh, position fo- saying as a pastor, um, you know, I'm going to focus on the gospel and spiritual things. I'm going to avoid anything that might smack of politics for fear of being seen as, you know, a, 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 what, what people are saying, a Christian national, whatever that is. Uh, or confusing the gospel with a political position or party. And hear me well, um, the, the politics in our country are, ex- they're just nasty. And people are really, they're, they're, they're uh, polarized. And it's, it is very possible to, uh, to confuse the gospel um, with a political position. But, but having said that, I would be wrong to say that, um, that, that government is not important. And uh, when I run into someone who has the position that we Christians should just ignore the government and ignore elections and ignore all that kind of stuff because that's just, they're going to hell anyway. And what we're going to do is just only deal on the spiritual side of things. When I, when I hear that, um, I, I want to have a discussion with them. What I want to do is say, okay, let me ask you a question. Let's try a thought experiment. Uh, let's say that you've been given a blank check to create a government for this new country. What, what, what is it going to look like? You get to desi- design it. You get to, to create it. And people will live under this thing. You tell me what it's going to look like. And most of the time they start off and say, well, you know, I, I, that'll never happen. No, 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 no. Assuming, let's just take a minute because you, now you're in the position of our founders when they were saying, how do we do this? So what are you going to do? Are you going to do a, is it going to be just a democracy? Is it going to be a king? Is it going to be a theocracy? Um, is it a constitutional republic? Are there checks and balances in the government? Are there specific limits to the government's authority and power? It's worth thinking about. And the moment you start doing that, you realize, you know, um, we're not perfect, but I like ours a whole lot better than I like others. We should take this stewardship of authority very seriously. So let me try an, uh, one more thought experiment I'm going to give you four situations for you, that you might that you could find yourself put yourself in, and I want you to consider how you'd respond in each. Would you submit to the government and obey its laws, or would you rebel? Are you ready for these? I'm going to give you all four. Yeah. Do I have you? Are you with me? How many have just absolutely quit? Okay. All right. Here we go. You're living as a shopkeeper in the 13 colonies in 1776. There's been a good deal of talk about breaking away from England, uh, who's been restrictive in taxation without representation in the government, From at least from the viewpoint of the colonists. They violated the freedom and rights of citizens in the colonies. Uh, so as a Christian, are you free to support the revolution, or must you remain obedient to England? That's a good question, isn't it? 
Are they asking you to do something that goes against God? Let me give you another one. It's, the, uh, it's 1863. You're a Christian in the Deep South. You're a plantation owner, and you own slaves. There, there, are, there are a lot of Christians in that situation. Though you treat your slaves well, you recognize that the, you know, that the present economy relies on slavery to continue, and the union is testing the principle of state rights to self-govern, and they're intruding into the South's affairs. And really unsure of all the reasons, you, you kind of see the, the North and the South is deeply divided. They're polarizing and on the brink of war. Uh, and you get called up to serve in the Confederate Army. What are you going to do? I, I want you to feel these things because this, these, these things are historically, hap- they, they've historically happened. And people wrestled with it. And they were saying, oh my gosh, what do we do? And, and people were torn apart by it. And families were torn uh, apart by it, trying to figure out what do we do? How about this one? You're a German Christian early in the war and have been drafted to serve. You're troubled with some of the government's policies like Jewish segregation in ghettos. And there are rumors that the Nazi government has really disturbing policies like the extermination of, uh, of Jews. But the government has brought prosperity and national pride and respect, which has been missing since the First World War. What do you do? Let me do one more. You are a Christian in a large city sometime between 1979 and 2015 uh, in mainland China. Uh, Gathering together for worship is regulated by the state. It's discouraged in large numbers. You can have up to 17 individuals in your home at a time, but no more. Further, uh, you have to be registered. If you're registered and you're called, you have to report to the state all who attend your meetings. You have to keep rolls. If you're summoned, will you appear and will you tell them who attends? And the state is mandated a one-child limit with forced abortions. If you become pregnant with your second, would you abort or would you disobey the law? Okay, so um, those are four instances where historically people have divided. And there, there are people, believe it or not, that, that, uh, that take every position all the way through. And some, some would take on some of these one side and take some, something on the other side. So um, it, I think that when you test out your, your perspective of what authority and government is, and then that's kind of where, that's kind of where you have to start saying, okay, wait, what do I believe, and what, um, where does it lead me? So let me give you one more. Uh, and, and nobody wants to talk about these kinds of things, really, because, you know, you, you, you kind of feel like, oh, my gosh, you know, what side am I going to get on? I'm going to get hit in the head one way or the other. So, so what about masks? Well, you know, masks really didn't do a lot unless you had a M90, whatever it is, uh, mask, and you wore it correctly. And, uh, and so... Um, you know, I mean, it, uh, it was like, really? Uh, okay, I've got a wife that is a, a nurse, and um, we talked a lot about it, and, but uh, where we were, everybody had to, in Oregon, we had to wear masks everywhere all the time, much longer than here in Idaho. Um, there were people that just pulled the mask off and said, you can't make me do it. Uh, I, I was probably, uh, I was under the, I, I thought, it's the law, it's a rule in Oregon. If I'm going to be in Oregon, I have to wear the, the mask. I don't know if it does any good. I'll try to do it as, as good as I can, but I have to do it. Okay, I think I'm submitting to, to a rule that I, that I didn't really like. What about meeting? 
Well, when we when we first started, um, you know, we we didn't meet for I think it was about a month, and at the end of that time, we're starting to say, "Now wait a minute, I'm not sure that we can do that because I think God wants us to meet." So it was very difficult for us as a church. We were trying to figure out what to do, and uh, we made decisions probably a lot like faith community did, and, uh, and it, it, it's difficult. And, and this is a reason why it's so important to, to talk with each other, to be respectful of each other, to listen and ask questions with each other. If you come down on different sides of this, not to rupture relations over this, but it is worth really talking through. Are you with me? Okay. So let me, I'm going to end with uh, giving you um, seven guidelines. Just prob- probing the parameters of godly rebellion. Um, and some of these are just summarizing everything. If the authorities command you to do what God forbids, obey God. So you must bow down to this statue. No. Nope. Uh, you have to have a forced abortion uh, if, the, if the pregnancy has not been authorized and in, in in you live in China. No? Uh, you have to teach evolution as the truth. No. No. If the authorities forbid you to do what God commands, obey God. So in, in the early first century, the policy... Uh, from Rome was abandoning unwanted babies to die outside the city walls of Rome. There was a prohibition in force to pick them up. And, and you know what? Uh, it, it, it was just a real interesting thing. Um, males were, uh, were um, accepted more than females. And if you had a female baby, many of them, they would, they would lean them up against the wall of Rome and then walk away. And, uh, and it was against the law to pick them up. But believers picked them up. They, they went against the prohibition. If you picked, it, picked up one of those babies and got caught, you suffered really dire consequences. But they looked at it and said, no. No. If the authorities to forbid you to do what God commands, obey God. Um, how, many, uh, how many of you have ever given to a missionary in a Muslim country? You know? Okay. A few, yeah. My guess is that in that Muslim country, it's against the law for that person to evangelize. Right? They're pretty, pretty stiff about that. But we would say we have to obey God rather than men, right? Yeah. Um, three, if the authorities command or forbid you to do what God is silent about, obey the authorities even if you disagree with or dislike the law. Um, so again, the mask issue or parking downtown during business hours if you live in Roseburg. Um, it's a pet peeve of mine. I don't think I'll ever let it go. Um, there's a bunch of a bunch of these things, and there's there's just a lot of things that we just you might not like, and you just go okay, okay. Uh, what what about um, four? If what you are told to do forces you to contribute in principle to what God clearly stands against, I think you have to resist evil. This is really hard. This, you know, something might not affect you. Uh, but the government or the school may not be dealing with you, but your silence uh, may allow them to do evil. And, and uh, that's a very gray area with few rules, and each believer has to follow, I think, the Lord's leading for his own life. There's no easy answers, but I think that, that where the evil is happening, um, I think if I, if I know it, if I see it, then I need to stand against it, I need to speak up against it, that kind of thing. Yeah. Sure. Common sense maybe has a little something to do with that. I mean, we all know our taxes don't always go towards what we believe in principle. So sure. Mean you pay no taxes. Yeah. So there's a 
a bit of common sense involved yeah. in that. Right. Obviously, not every dollar is going to go towards something that we as Christians. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it, um, do I want my tax dollars to go to abortions? No. Do they? Yeah. Yeah. Am I going to pay my taxes? Yeah. Yeah. So there's, that's why I said that this one is a little, you know, a little off or it's, it's harder to determine, but each person really needs to think it through. Um, you know, um, there are evil things that, that happen. It's, I think exposing kids to pornography in school, that's, that's really not good. That's not good. And we're doing it. Um, you know, we're supporting the libraries or the schools uh, with our tax dollars. Okay, yeah, I get that. I'm, I'm, uh, but I can tell you that I'm going to speak up against that. Um, and where I have opportunity, I will uh, try to make sure that that doesn't happen. But there's a lot of things like that. And, and yeah, you're right. There's, you have to be judicious and careful about some of these things. Uh, otherwise, you know, we're in the world and we're not of the world, but, you know, the only way not to be tainted by some of these things is, I guess you could, you'd have to totally be, you know, you have to be, have to totally be, you know, get on a deserted island or something. Okay. Um, number five. Disobedience is the last resort when all other options are exhausted. Daniel 1 is a really interesting interchange between the young Jewish teen, teens that were taken, in, uh, taken away from Jerusalem. I think it was 605 or 604, maybe 597, right in there, that they were taken over to Babylon before, um, Israel, before Jerusalem fell. And um, in, in Daniel chapter 1, there's a, this interchange between young Jewish teens um, who were groomed for leadership roles in the, in the government, and they were supposed to eat the same food as the king, which probably violated Jewish dietary laws. But instead of saying, we're not doing that, we're not going to do that, they tried reasoning first, and they offered creative alternatives, and God honored that. And I think that, that any time that we can um, offer you know, alternatives, we can say, well, let's not do this, can we do that? Um, I think uh, instead of rushing toward uh, disobedience and making you know, the firm stand on some issues, it's better to try to think through how else could we do this. Six, when compliance or disobedience, whether uh, uh, all responses to authority must be done with recognition and respect for authority, whether it's compliance or disobedience. Um, if the backdrop is, of our disobedience is a well-known and well-regarded reputation of respect for authority, then that disobedience, I think, will have a greater impact. It'll cause more people to sit up and think. If, if they said, you know, Walker isn't a guy that always is going around yelling. He's not wearing, um, uh, you know, T-shirts that incite rebellion. And yet here he is standing against th this thing. And uh, this is really out of character. He's, he's typically not like that. Maybe this is really important. I think that's the idea. And then lastly, when dis disobedience to authorities is taken, you have to be willing to accept gracefully the consequences and suffering that follow. Uh, so when we disobey, we mustn't be surprised when the authorities try to punish us because they probably will. And I, you know, I think of Martin Luther King and... Um, some of the things that happened to him and people who followed him um, when he was, you know, pushing civil rights, and um, and you know, there's a lot of there's punishment would come in uh, in other parts of the world. Being a Christian uh, is outlawed, and when they baptize people or when they meet together, um, sometimes, uh, especially Christian leaders get scooped up, and they pay the price. Is it worth paying the price? Yeah, yeah, yep. Uh, should they pay the price? Well, no, but the authority has to answer to God for that. Okay, I think that's, I think we're almost there. So, all this really matters only to those who, um, who, feel the weight of Christ's authority in our lives 
if you really couldn't care less about uh, obeying God, then you'll probably take the, the path of least resistance. You'll do whatever other people say to avoid suffering, uh, or you know, you, you'll preserve and protect your own quality of life and standard of living. But if you, if you and I are really concerned about God and his word and what he says, then, and if you think that all authority really does come from him and no authority rivals him, then at some point um, you're, you'll probably run into a, uh, an issue where authority is conflicted. You've got to make some decisions. Now, let me just say one last thing and then, then uh, we'll, we'll call it good. I think that uh, in the next year, this, this is really going to come to a head. I think you're going to have to make some really tough decisions. And Christians will have to make some big decisions and uh, they'll have to try to figure out uh, about authority on really practical levels. That's one of the reasons why I went to great lengths to talk about authority and then also um, try to say that there are times where you'll have to say no. I hope not. hope everything turns out great. But I, I'm not really sure it will. Okay, any questions? Yeah? Do you think that it's possible that somebody could be placed in a position of authority without God actually giving them authority? Mm -hmm. uh, the examples that I have that yeah. they're thinking about is, you know, in the South when, when people were oppressed and threatened with physical harm, they didn't go out and vote, which is our way of putting somebody in authority. Yeah. Okay. Um, and so then other people were placing authority. So to state that a different way, would it be possible for a man to, in our rebellious state, cause something to happen that uh, God didn't want to happen? Yeah. I mean, I understand the will of God. Sure. sure. Yeah, in the providence of God, people, um, you know, kingdoms uh, rise up against kingdoms and... Uh, some kingdoms fall and others take over. And so, you know, you can say, well, that's not legitimate authority, but it, it's the way things happen. And um, uh, I, I, don't like, I don't like that, um, but I have to trust God's providence in it. Do I, um, do I think that that could happen? I think that people c can handle people in authority, granted that they're there, they can then... Um, they can, they can wield the authority in an ungodly way and God will hold them responsible. Um, it's sort of like if you, you want, do you want that scepter? Do you really want that scepter? Because the living God is going to, you're going to have to answer to him on, with this thing. So, yeah, I, I, that's a good question. I'm not sure I have a good answer. Anything else? Okay. So what's next? What's next week? So next week we got David Gibson coming. Give us a little primer on how to share your faith. So come on out. Three weeks of that. Not exactly just that, but sharing your faith, teaching your faith, and uh, one other lecture that's going to be really good. But I can't remember the title. <laughs> good. Thanks, Steve. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Appreciate it. Yep. Okay. Let me pray, and we'll uh, everybody can go home. God, we're really grateful that you deeply love us, that you uh, are providential, that your hand is at work in all of our lives. We pray for uh, the authorities, uh, wherever they be, may be found, for the authority that you've granted to each one of us in our spheres of influence. We pray that we would honor you um, with that authority, that we would do what you want, um, that we would be gracious and kind and understanding and listening, but also accept the responsibility of that authority. We pray for our government. We pray for this coming year. We pray for peace. Um, we pray that your hand would be seen. And um, Lord, we love you. We look forward to the coming of Christ in his kingdom. We're, we uh, give you praise uh, in Jesus' name. Amen.